Senator. Sorry. What's the biggest non-issue in your mind that Congress keeps debating needlessly? <laughs> Benghazi. <laughs> Very Let's good. move one on. One answer. There you I, go. One. I, I, look, the families of this country deserve an answer on Benghazi. I think it's outrageous that people There's, died, and okay. Senator Udall is refusing to provide answers for the families of this country. Oh. All right, folks, welcome back. Joining us now is my friend Andy McCarthy, former federal prosecutor. He helped put the blind sheik behind bars, New York Times bestselling author, his latest faithless execution, building the political case for Obama's impeachment, and, of course, columnist and senior fellow at the National Review. Hey, Andy. Steve, how are you? Good. Great to talk to you again. All right, before we get to your piece, which is, is just mind-boggling, I, I, I was just made aware, and I want to throw you a curb here, but I specifically remember a bizarre statement in, a, in one of the speeches Obama gave or press conferences he gave the other day where I heard him saying he, I, that he can't mean this, that one thing is for sure, that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not paramount anymore. It's not the cause of ISIS. It's not the, the main problem we have in the Middle East. And I heard that, and I played it on the air, and I'm saying I, I still can't understand why I would never expect him to say that. And then John Kerry today, Israel's furious over this, John Kerry says, the truth is there wasn't a leader I met with in the region who didn't raise with me spontaneously the need to try to get peace between Israel and the Palestinians because it was a cause of recruitment and of street anger and agitation that they all felt and I see it, I see a lot of the heads nodding here. They, they had to respond to. In other words, it's Israel's fault that, that uh, ISIS is getting recruits. Yeah, well, I think these guys are not all playing off the same sheet of music, Steve. I, uh, Kerry, uh, Kerry's statements on their face are absurd, but I think they're reflective of the policy that Obama, with the exception of the remarks that you alluded to, has followed all along. And... You know, unfortunately, it's not just this administration. I think this administration has ratcheted it up. Uh, but this this uh, idea that if we could just solve the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which, of course, from our perspective or our government's perspective, means pressure Israel into cutting a terrible deal with people who will never make a deal with it because they won't be satisfied with anything less, uh, less than Israel's yeah. destruction. If only we could do that. Uh, all of our terrorism problem, our national security problem would go away. And, of course, it's preposterous. I, you know, I was involved in the cases in the 90s when, you know, the, the, the terrorist threat first hit us domestically, and it was remarkable how little conversation there was uh, among the jihadists at the time uh, about the uh, Israeli-Palestinian dispute. Uh, I'm not yep. saying that it never came up, but, you know, they had uh, they regarded America as the head of the snake and they wouldn't have been satisfied. Uh, they'll be satisfied with nothing other than, uh, you know, the hegemonic imposition of their right. version of Islam. Sharia. Absolutely. And by the way, if if, if Israel would do what you said, uh, uh, then uh, uh, Ebola would go away, too, because that's probably Israel's fault as well. But you wrote a great piece, Andy, um, at NashReview.com, talking about the fact that this newest indictment against the Benghazi suspect that we have in custody doesn't even mention al-Qaeda. This is more politics being played by this administration, is it not? Yeah, I think it absolutely is, Steve. It really doesn't change the story that the government is running with beyond the original indictment, which we talked about some time ago, and that was actually, you know, designed to sit comfortably with the Obama administration's political claims about what happened in Benghazi. They basically tell you that everything you need to know about Benghazi happened in this snapshot between about 9 o'clock at night on September 11th and 5 o'clock the following morning. You don't need to know anything that went on before then, including the serial jihadist attacks in eastern Libya, including an attack on that diplomatic mission itself, including the fact that the head of al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, on the day before September 11th, called on Libyan jihadists to avenge the al-Qaeda operative who was the top guy they had in Libya. All the al-Qaeda stuff, you don't need to know about it. The only thing you need to know is that this was a spontaneous sort of uprising that got out of control and that somehow terrorists, we don't want to say who, uh, got involved in it. Yeah, well, I can't wait for those hearings. Uh, Andy, uh, always great talking to you, sir. Uh, have a great weekend, and we'll speak to you very soon.
Thanks so much, Steve. The great Andy McCarthy, ladies and gentlemen, here on the Steve Malzberg Show. Uh, really, go, go to nationalreview.com and, and check this out. This, uh, this, this piece is, uh, is unbelievable, and it, it just shows where this administration is coming from. It is, it is mind-boggling on every single thing they do. All right, um, we're going to be rejoined by the uh, you know him, you love a Molesburg panel, as they say, after the break. But first, first, let's take a look at the uh, Clara Barton Historic Site. My uncle used to teach at Clara Barton High School in Brooklyn, in Glen Echo, Maryland. Watch this. If disaster struck at the turn of the 20th century, this house might have held your salvation. Perched on a hill above the Potomac River in Glen Echo, Maryland, it's the first National Historic Site dedicated to the accomplishments of a woman, Clara Barton. The home has been described as warehouse-like, hospital-like, hotel-like, sanctuary-like, and that's exactly what Clara Barton intended. Enter the front parlor and you'll see a familiar symbol. Barton founded the American Red Cross. Her home was its headquarters starting in 1897. In fact, the boards on the Clara Barton home came from Red Cross shelters during the Johnstown, Pennsylvania floods of 1889. After the structures were disassembled, they were shipped here. Though the house is about the size of a riverboat, every inch was put to use. Red Cross offices are on the first floor. Barton's residence is on the second floor, along with rooms to house volunteers. A pulley out the third floor window lowered emergency supplies to horse-drawn wagons below. They would travel down the road to Washington, D.C., where they would be loaded on rail cars. Parlors were places Red Cross volunteers would unwind after a busy day, and closets are everywhere, filled with precious supplies and first aid. Barton built the Red Cross, using what she learned as a nurse at war. During the Civil War, she gained fame setting up field hospitals to tend to the wounded at battles like Bull Run and Antietam, work which earned her the nickname Angel of the Battlefield. She wrote of the need for the American Red Cross, philanthropy has been grafted onto the wild and savage stem of war. Clara never married. Her life was dedicated to helping those in need during wars and natural disasters like tornadoes, earthquakes, and hurricanes. Wherever there was suffering, Barton intended to lend the hand of God, all from within these walls. I'm Lucy Celia, and this is An American Place on Newsmax TV. The White House says the coalition remains committed to attacking ISIS. I'm Miranda Khan, and this story tops your Newsmax Now update. The press secretary adds that targeting ISIS is easier since they've gathered in one area on the Turkish border. The White House reports it stepped up operations around there near the Syrian city of Kobani. But the Pentagon says that town may fall into the hands of the ISIS radicals. General Austin Lloyd also says Kurdish fighters are stepping up to defend Kobani. From national security to health security, President Obama appoints Ron Klain to head the response to the Ebola crisis. Klain served as chief of staff under Vice President Joe Biden. And in the Caribbean, Bermuda braces for Gonzalo. The Category 3 hurricane now packs 125 mile per hour winds. That's your latest Newsmax Now update. We'll have more coming your way in about 30 minutes.